On January 16, 1943, the SS Schenectady sat quietly at dock in Portland, Oregon. A brand new Liberty ship, barely 10 weeks old, fresh from the Kaiser shipyards. No enemy planes, no storms, no warning. Then a single sharp crack echoed across the harbor. Within seconds, the entire vessel fractured clean in two. The deck split from keel to rail as if sliced by an invisible blade. Her bow and stern sagged in opposite directions, a ship's back broken while tied safely to the pier. The Schenectady wasn't alone. That same winter, the SS John P. Gaines broke apart in calm seas. The SS Manhattan, a T-2 tanker built by the same method, cracked so severely her crew abandoned ship. Between 1943 and 1944, more than 2,500 Liberty ships reported structural failures, hull cracks, deck fractures, even catastrophic splits. Nineteen broke completely in half. Three simply vanished at sea, disintegrating so suddenly they never sent distress signals. These weren't casualties of war. They were ships committing suicide. After Pearl Harbor, America had staked everything on the Liberty Ship Program. The nation needed cargo vessels fast, hundreds of them. Traditional shipbuilding took eight months per haul. Industrialist Henry Kaiser promised to do it in weeks. He'd never built ships before. But his Richmond, California shipyards applied automotive logic to naval construction, prefabricated sections, assembly line production, and, most revolutionary of all, welding instead of riveting. By late 1942, Liberty ships were launching in just 42 days. The record came in November. The SS Robert E. Peary built in four days and 15 hours. It was an industrial miracle. Newsreels celebrated Rosie the Riveters, though they were welders now, forging the fleet that would feed the front lines. But soon, those miracle ships began breaking apart not from U-boats or storms, but in calm, peaceful seas. No one understood why. Historical architects were baffled. The welds looked perfect. The steel met specifications. The designs came from proven British blueprints. And yet Liberty ships were fracturing like porcelain teacups. Investigations followed. Engineers, metallurgists, inspectors, but while committees debated, the ships kept cracking. The answer came not from a lab or an office, but from a welder on the night shift. Her name was Bessie Hamill. She worked at Kaiser's Richmond Yard No. 3, one of thousands of women who'd taken up torches while the men went to war. Bessie had noticed something strange. Every night she watched welders start at the edges of hull plates and work inward, or weld long seams from end to end without pause. As each weld cooled, the metal contracted, pulling the plates out of shape and locking massive stresses into the structure. She could see it happening, steel plates bowing, twisting, fighting against the cooling seams. Her foreman dismissed her, you're a welder, not an engineer, but she persisted. In November 1943, Hamill defied protocol and demanded a meeting with supervisors. She brought test samples she'd welded on her own time. Those welded from the center outward lay flat and true. The others warped, stressed, distorted. One supervisor came to see for himself. What he witnessed confirmed her fears. They were literally building stress into every Liberty ship hall. Hamill's insight was simple, but revolutionary. Weld from the center outward. Alternate welding spots to let heat dissipate. Never run a long, continuous weld in one direction. Distribute the stress. Don't trap it. 
By December 1943, word of her discovery reached Henry Kaiser himself. He faced a brutal truth. If Hamel was right, every Liberty ship ever built carried the seeds of its own destruction. Kaiser could deny it and keep building or stop everything to fix it. He chose the latter. Tests proved Hamel right. Whole sections welded the old way showed residual stresses above 30,000 PSI, enough to tear steel apart. Her sequenced welds cut that to less than half. The steel was identical, the welds were identical, only the order had changed, and the difference was life or death. The real villain was physics. Steel expands under a torch, then contracts as it cools. But if it can't move, the stress stays locked inside. And when that stressed steel hit the freezing North Atlantic, it turned brittle, more like glass than metal. A single microscopic crack at a sharp corner could race through the hull faster than the speed of sound, splitting the ship in seconds. Riveted ships never had this problem. Their overlapping plates and seams acted like brakes, stopping cracks from spreading. Welded holes, continuous and seamless, had no such defense. The Liberty ship's squared-off design only made it worse. Sharp corners multiplied the stress. Each wave became a hammer blow, each weld a potential fracture line. In January 1944, Henry Kaiser made his most daring decision yet. He halted production at Richmond Yard No. 2 and ordered the creation of a new ship entirely, the Victory Ship. This wasn't a tweak, it was a total redesign. Rounded corners replaced square hatches. Stronger, low-temperature steel was introduced, with nickel and manganese for toughness. And most crucially, Every weld would follow Bessie Hamill's sequencing system. The workforce, 90,000 strong, was retrained. Each welder carried a numbered sequence card. Every weld ordered, color-coded, checked, and recorded. Sections were prefabricated in small modules, stress relieved in furnaces, and joined in massive synchronized assemblies. Production slowed at first, 18 days, then 16 days per ship, and critics declared the program a failure. But the cracks were gone. Zero failures. Kaiser didn't chase headlines. He watched inspection reports. By April 1944, Richmond Yard No. 2 looked less like a shipyard and more like a symphony of steel and fire. Every plate, every weld, every schedule choreographed to the minute. The critical path method, Kaiser called it, the science of speed without compromise. Then on June 27, 1944, came redemption. The SS Benjamin Warner, victory ship hull number 23, rolled down the ways just five days and 11 hours after keel laying. A full-sized ocean freighter built faster and stronger than anything before it. Not a stripped-down demonstration, a battle-ready vessel, ready for sea. The Liberty ships had carried America through the darkest years of the war and taught her a brutal lesson. Speed without understanding can be as dangerous as the enemy. But from their failures rose the Victory ships, faster, stronger, safer, each one a testament not just to industrial genius, but to the courage of a single welder who refused to stay silent while the ships she built were breaking apart. Bessie Hamill, the woman who saved a fleet.